I want to talk about uh, Robert Peel, second baronet of, uh, let's see, of, uh, I can't remember what it is, uh, second baronet of, of their country estate, uh, whatever it's called, Bury, I think. Um, This is not the same Robert Peel. This is not Sir Robert Peel as I was calling him before. Now I'm going to refer to this Robert Peel as just Robert Peel, uh, Prime Minister Peel, uh, we could say. Um, so this is a big uh, turning point. We, we noticed that liberal reforms are, are making their way through Parliament and coinciding with this is the rise to power of Prime Minister Peel. Prime Minister, the executive of the British uh, Empire, which is the largest empire the world had ever seen at this time. Uh, the, it was said that the sun did not set on the British Empire uh, because the British Empire existed all the way around the globe. There was no time of the day where the where it wasn't a happy hour in Britain, someplace, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, and so this is quite a a rise to power. Prime Minister Peel's grandfather was Parsley Peel. And his father was a yeoman farmer. Prime Minister Peel's great grandfather was somebody who owned land, but worked by the sweat of their brow. Prime Minister Peel never worked a day in his life and comes to be the most powerful person in Great Britain. Uh, seconded only by Queen Victoria, who still had a lot of uh, uh, political and moral authority, but it is Prime Minister Peel who's really running the country. And by the end of uh, Prime Minister Peel's second term, which will occur a little while later, the supremacy of the premiership being prime minister uh, is pretty much a done deal. This is a revolution. The monarchy has been eliminated, except for ceremonial purposes. Finally, you know, we go back to uh, Charles I, who ruled in his personal absolute rule for 11 years. We go through the first phase of the revolution to get to the Settlement Act of 1701. And then through industrial technology, including the industrial technology of setting up a factory in order to exploit the labor of the working class, uh, the bourgeoisie in the form of the family peel takes over. And it's not the, it's not the nobility. It's not the traditional nobility. It's a family that is very rooted recently in yeoman, farmer, working by the sweat of your brow. Um, and, and so uh, this is, you know, a, a total negation of the feudal order. Remnants of the feudal order still hang on. Even to this day, you know, you have knights and, and uh, baronets and all these things. You know, you have Sir Paul McCartney, right, of the Beatles, uh, 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's not the same as it was uh, back in the feudal days. And by the mid 19th century, we have the emergence of liberal bourgeois capitalism, which is a political ideology, uh, largely embodied in the parliament. Um, Uh, now, uh, Prime Minister Peel is a conservative, uh, but with his downfall in his second term, and, and I'll have more to say about that, it, it lays all the groundwork for liberalism to emerge. Okay. So, uh, this is the big story. The bourgeoisie is now on top. The revolution has been realized uh, in a way that it never was previously. Now, uh, now, uh, poor law amendment act. So they're still working on the poor laws. They're still concerned about this. This is part of that 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 liberalist uh, concern. Now, the way it's framed by Prime Minister Peel. And uh, the Kerns, uh, the Tories and the Whigs is in terms of Malthusianism, iron law of wages and utilitarianism. Uh, Malthusianism is, is named after a guy named Malthus. He was a, uh, an influential uh, economist at this time. And he argued that uh, you don't want to give poor relief to the poor because if you do that, they'll have bigger families and there's not enough food supply to feed them. At some point, we're going to end, we're going to reach the end of the British agricultural revolution, which is still underway. And I talked about that uh, way back at some point. And um, that British agricultural revolution is still underway, but Malthus sees the end of that coming soon, and he has some mathematical economic arguments uh, for that, which are. I have to say, um, relatively convincing. I, I wouldn't put it exactly the way he puts it, uh, but the only reason that Malthus was wrong in the long run here is because no one accounted for the effect of fossil fuels. Okay, so uh, fossil fuels gave the Malthusian uh, doomsday predictions uh, a lease on life. Uh, to be pushed out, but now, now we're in another crisis, and we're reaching that Malthusian point now. Um, uh, at, in Malthus's day, the population had risen above a billion people on the planet. So I'm thinking globally now, uh, and uh, so maybe at most we're at like 1.5 billion people in Malthus's day. Today, now in 2021, we're going past 8 billion. And once we get past 8 billion, 10 billion is not far behind just because of the, the, the way that population growth works. It's an exponential curve. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, we're reaching another crisis point unless we get another reprieve, like another big source of energy other than fossil fuels. Uh, we're facing an agricultural crisis um, that will be devastating. It's a Malthusian moment that we're in. Uh, so it's time to relook at Mal Malthus. Uh, but at this time, he was using it for very conservative uh, political reasons, saying, don't give the poor poor relief because they're just going to have more children. And ultimately, there's not enough food to feed all these babies that they're having. That, that's, you know, that is not something that I, I would agree with. A very, very anti-social sort of political agenda. And, and we see that um, there are some conservatives like Malthus that are very anti-social. 
that are anti-socialist. In the way that Owen is a socialist, Malthus is an anti-socialist. Uh, kind of can see all the, the suffering and all the problems, uh, but his solution is to, is to, uh, is to fix it by, with austerity for the poor. Uh, and, and austerity is something that we're experiencing more and more of in our today's world in 2021. Now, another part of this ideology that's wrapped up in this act is the iron law of wages, which is uh, a principle uh, defined clearly, if not for the first time, by R Richard Ricardo, who is one of the big classical economists, um, Adam Smith and, and uh, and Ricardo, David Ricardo, um, these are the, the two big classical economists that, uh, for example, Marx uh, uh, largely adopts basic premises from uh, because he didn't want to argue about the basic premises. It was like, okay, let's assume that, that uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo are correct about the labor theory of value uh, then what implications does that have? And uh, the iron law of wages that David Ricardo laid out is that wages on average will tend towards the minimum wage necessary to sustain the life of the laborer. So it's just subsistence level. So it's kind of like uh, Ricardo sees that even with all the mechanisms of capitalism as it had developed in his time in the early 19th century, um, even with all the, the machinations of capitalism and, and wage earning, uh, what Marxists call wage slavery, uh, uh, it, it is a kind of slavery that drives the laborer to subsistence level, just like the serf was always kept at subsistence level, just enough uh, resources to keep them and their family alive in order to uh, reproduce the whole process over again, that, that reproduction of labor, but at a bare minimum subsistence level. And Ricardo argued that wages tend towards that bare minimum. That's called the iron law of wages. Utilitarianism um, is, was started by Jerry, Jeremy Bentham. And I mentioned Bentham earlier as being an investor with Owen and, and Bentham uh, kind of, he's kind of one of these early liberals. They speak of helping the poor. Uh, you know, utilitarian slogan is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. And that's not just a slogan, it's a, it's a moral principle. So if you take ethics, philosophy 102, you'll study utilitarianism. And uh, this in Bentham and then John Stuart Mill with his, was his student, uh, they developed this idea that uh, if you stick to this principle, you can decide moral issues. And both of them are politicians. So they are thinking in terms of parliamentary policy. If you think about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, okay, maybe not everybody's going to be maximally happy, but we're going to try to create some broad based happiness which sounds like they're really concerned about the working poor and, 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 and uh, even the indigent and whatnot, which, which they were in principle. Uh, but utilitarianism as it was actually applied in politics, like in the poor law amendment, um, tended to, in many ways, at least half the time, uh, favor conservative political agendas. Um, and, and so they would, they would think about all the negative consequences of giving relief to the poor. And then this feed the consequences uh, and utilitarian is called a consequentialist ethical approach. And so it's not just like what would be nice in the moment, but you got to think of the knock on effects, like what's going to happen after we give out the poor relief and then that feeds right into the Malthusian argument.
Okay. So what this develops into in this act is that uh, it outlines in, in rough outline that there's gonna be a revision of the system of poor relief so that poor relief is only going to be distributed in workhouses. And it's explicitly stated that these workhouses are going to be so miserable as to deter any but the, tr but the truly destitute. Uh, and, and the policies that develop are uh, widespread family separation, for example, which we've seen at the southern border of the United States, the sort of terror that, that uh, family separations involves. This, you know, they did that here. Again, if anybody wanted to know, we could look at these experiences and see, oh, this, is this a good idea? Does this turn out good in the long run? Uh, because this does not turn out good in the long run. So now this is a kind of a reversal of some of the other policies that we've seen earlier, going back to the 1723 kind of version of poor relief from a century earlier, where uh, people can only receive uh, poor relief, welfare as we call it, if they go into the workhouse and then they're gonna wake, make the working conditions in these workhouses so miserable so that nobody wants to be there. And then this is gonna deter people from actually seeking relief. Um, and this is a very Dickensian arrangement. Um, so this is, this is one of the foundations of Dickensian Britain, Britain, Britain uh, Dickensian London in particular. Uh, Charles Dickens is known for A Christmas Carol. Uh, a Chris, is that A Christmas Carol? Where the ghosts visit uh, Scrooge. Um, <clears throat> but he's also known for a book called Oliver Twist or The Parish Boy's Progress. And remember, a parish boy is a boy who's receiving poor relief within a particular parish due to the poor laws. Um, And, and in, in this book, the, the horrors of the workhouse are, are clearly depicted in kind of melodramatic ways, but based in reality. Um, so now Owen is still out there. He's still uh, working away, trying to build socialist organizations and, and promoting his utopian ideas. Uh, he heads the Grand National Consolidated Trade Unions. So this is the beginning of the trade union movement in England, which then becomes very, uh, very uh, popular and ultimately very popular, or not only popular, but ultimately very powerful in British politics uh, over the coming decade and century. Uh, so Owen is in is involved in these early trade union sort of efforts. Uh, he founds the Association of All Classes of All Nations, a, another a sort of trade unionist, uh, but with an international flair. And and that's uh, you know with Marx and Engels, they're they're a key part of the first international, the first international workers union, um, and, and they have international in their name. Owen is already thinking about internationalism as a key component of socialism. So we see Owen is, is a great inspiration, uh, a large inspiration for Marx and Engels. And, um, and, and so that's why you know, I'm really emphasizing um, his story here. And notice that he just keeps on truck and, and keeps on experimenting. And uh, again, he has this kind of anarchist uh, sort of spirit, which becomes a very important um, rival really to Marxism. It's, it's Marxism or anarchism that then become the dominant schools in the socialist movement as we, meet, as we uh, get into the end of the 19th century. And Owen is, is a bit of both. Uh, and, and thus, that's why Marx and Engels are very 
specifically critical of Owen because they're trying to distinguish communism uh, from this emerging anarchism and uh, from uh, utopian socialism and all this kind of thing. There's also the London uh, Working Men's Association, an early union that's formed at this time. Owen's not part of that. Uh, and Owen founds the National Friendly Association. So he's just uh, all over the place getting involved with these org organizations and promoting his utopian socialist ideas within them. And, um, and some of these uh, organizations are more religious in character. So Owen himself uh, was something of an atheist. Uh, you know, he was very critical of Anglicanism, especially. Um, you know, as we can see with Sir Robert Peel, you know, Anglicanism could be a way of, of justifying the exploitation of child labor, for example, because you didn't want to uh, corrupt the morals of the children by allowing them not to work 12 hours a day. Um, and Owen, you know, is highly critical of conventional religion. Uh, but he has an affinity for fringe religious ideas that are emerging at this time. Okay. All right, so, so Owen is a, is a big, is a big um, inspiration for Marx and Engels, and they mention him specifically in the Communist Manifesto. They also specifically mention Chartism, and Chartism comes out of the People's Charter of 1838. And so what the, uh, this is something that's advocated by the likes of the Poor Man's Guardian, that newspaper, the London Working Men's Association, was, which was newly formed, uh, and others uh, as well, but people who are thinking in a trade unionist way, a socialist sort of way, maybe some socialist utopians, maybe some kind of anarchist ideas. You know, it's, it's a mixed bag. This is the very early days, uh, but this is a, a big demonstration of people power. Now, remember that we have uh, the Reform Act of 1832. This is just six years later. So now you have this, the, the, the working class and even some that would maybe not even be considered, that might be considered even middle class, people that are enfranchised for the first time. They're voters. They vote for their members of parliament and they're feeling uh, emboldened to, to make more free decisions about the political process and to exert their power as a voting bloc. And, um, and so uh, part of the uproar in 1838 was they saw the Poor Law Amendment Act that I was just talking about, the Dickensian Oliver Twist uh, sort of poor law. They saw that as a deep betrayal of the promise of the Reform Act of 1832. In 1832, it seemed like the parliament was becoming more what we would call liberal, but they didn't even have that terminology, but become more socialistic and, and trying to help the working man. But with the Poor Law Amendment of 1834, it demonstrated a sort of cruelty uh, still present within the conservative ranks of the parliament and, and their ability to put that through. So they had six points, all right? So this is a charter. It's a document and they wrote this up and, and publicized it. And they, they, they boiled it down to six demands. They wanted suffrage for every male 21 years or older of sound mind, not imprisoned, okay? And a secret ballot. Remember I talked about uh, the rotten boroughs or the pocket boroughs like the way that Sir Robert Peel initially got into Parliament was buying up tenement blocks of tenement uh, apartment style housing rentals, and then forcing, you know, through through, you know, uh, subtle means, forcing the people who live in his apartments to vote for him. Uh, 
because there was no secret ballot. So they want a secret ballot, uh, no, no property qualification. So that in 1832, the requirement was that you had to be taxed at least 10 pounds. That means you have something to tax. You have some kind of property that's taxable. Uh, they want everybody to be able to vote if they're uh, 21 years old, 21 or older. And we're only talking about males. I mean, this is uh, 1832 had just happened six years before. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and and something I should mention too about male exclusive voting, the family structure was still in place much more so than it is today. So that, you know, the thinking was that a family would vote for a particular candidate and the male was like the head of the household. This is a patriarchal and, and problematic in all the ways that, that we see today. Um, but, uh, but, but that's why the idea of a women's vote wasn't really on the radar for them because the wife would feel like she was voting through her husband. He was the representative of their family and their family was ideally, obviously this wasn't happening uh, uh, smoothly, but, um, but that was kind of the ideal way of thinking about it. Um, no property qualifications, payment of members of parliament so that working class guys could quit their job and actually go to parliament and be a politician. Before this, it didn't matter whether you're in the House of Lords, the House of Commons, you had to be independently wealthy in order to be a member of parliament. And, and that's still an issue in the United States. I mean, members of parliament or uh, members of Congress in the United States today get paid uh, pretty healthily, but they have to have an apartment in Washington D.C. They have to, uh, you know, fly back and forth uh, sometimes for personal reasons to their to their hometown. Their wife and kids are living back in their hometown. They have to maintain a residence in their hometown. So it becomes quite expensive very quickly and, and precludes um, a, a lot of working class people from, from running for Congress. And, and that's with payment. Uh, here in England, there's, there's no payment for members of parliament. So that's a big impediment for uh, you know, working people to actually participate as leaders in, in, in politics. So they want payment for uh, parliament. Uh, proportional representation on a per capita basis, um, which was not the case at this point. So, you know, certain counties would get a certain number of uh, members of parliament, whether they had just a, a, a bunch of sheep and a few people living there, or if it was a crowded, um, uh, you know, crowded uh, tenement uh, area. And they wanted annual elections so that every year you would have an election for your member of parliament. Uh, and this is what they saw as a, a big key element to keep corruption from happening because every year a politician would have to go face the voters. Um, <clears throat> in the following year, so this is, this is an ongoing thing, uh, you know, a kind of, what we might call a meme, the, the charter is a meme that's being passed around and propagandized and gaining support as a movement. It's just kind of growing in an organic uh, meme uh, viral kind of way. And in 1839, there's the Newport uh, Rising, which, uh, which has 4,000 protesters. That's a pretty big protest event uh, for the population size of England at this time. And the military uh, comes in to support the police and, uh, and opens fire on the crowd. 50 people are seriously injured, 22 are killed, uh, four soldiers are in injured. It's a, it's a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big uh, disastrous uh, kind of affair. And the leaders of the Newport Rising, a uh, uh, couple of guys identified as the leaders are convicted of treason. Um, and and 
the original sentence, if I remember, is, is that they were to be hanged and then drawn and quartered. They're, they're going to be hanged in public and then drawn in quarters when you tie ropes to all four limbs, arms and legs, and then have four horses run in four different directions and tear the body apart. Uh, it's a very archaic um, spectacle of torture or, or, or desecration of a dead body uh, that seems, you know, downright medieval. Um, but this was what was considered, but uh, it was commuted to uh, forced labor in a, in a labor detention camp. Um, and Chartism, you know, then never quite uh, calms down until the 1850s. So Chartism is a kind of central feature of working class politics. Uh, for the next uh, decade. And, and again, it, it is uh, something that's mentioned in the Communist Manifesto. And, and Marx and Engels say something to the effect like, you know, we even support Chartism. Meaning that, you know, and the implication is, you know, even if it, it does turn into violent uprisings at times, you know, the people's voice need to be heard. And this, this has to just be accepted as part of the political process. Um, okay, so there's the Owenite uh, Universal Community Society of Rational Religionists, um, some of the earlier uh, socialist organization that Owen had founded uh, consolidate into this this organization in 1839. Um, prime Minister Peel is a, again the Prime Minister from 1841 to 1846, and this is when Peel is at is at his, at its height of power. So, um, and, and this is really where uh, again it's just we have the bourgeois revolution embodied in Prime Minister Peel. Uh, and again, this is like the, the party's over, right? The, the revolution has, has set in. And, and so much so that we have uh, a conservative prime minister who comes out of working uh, commoner, uh, working class roots uh, very quickly to the highest level of power, the, pr the premiership is more powerful than it's ever been in the history uh, of the British Empire. The British Empire is, is at the height of its power, um, an empire like nobody had ever seen in the history of the universe. And uh, Prime Minister Peel sitting at the top of it. Queen Victoria is getting older and less politically active and more of a figurehead. And this kind of sets the model from here on out of this parliamentary monarchy that is very Republican in character. And, um, and, uh, and then, you know, we have a few more uh, modifications of the industrial uh, textile revolution. John Bolo invents uh, the Lancashire loom, which is, um, which is a, a, uh, a significant improvement over the Cartwright power loom and becomes the standard power loom for, for the rest of the 19th century. And I have a video of it here that you can take a look at. Um, the only non-automated part uh, for this Uh, um, so I have a, a video here of the Cartwright power loom, which it looks like it's heavily modified. It's a modern, you know, uh, Cartwright power loom, but something along the lines of what Bullo was using before he invented his own Lancaster uh, loom. Um, 
it's interesting to just to look at the, the difference between here. Uh, in this video, we can see the flying shuttle uh, being operated very much almost like the way it would be handled manually by a, a human operator, but it is fully automated. Uh, but the Lancashire loom, the only part of the process that isn't um, automated is that an operator has to change the thread in the shuttle every so often. Uh, but other than that, he just stands there and watches it. And then when it's time to change the shuttle, he changes it out and puts in another one and then continues on. Uh, but it's the operator now is basically just babysitting. And, and in the video, he's doing two machines simultaneously, but he could be doing you know, eight or 10 machines probably. Um, and then not long after we have the Dobby loom, which actually is a kind of a, a, a automation of the draw loom, but with a jacquard device, it's specifically designed for a jacquard device to create complicated patterns. Uh, so the Dobby loom is really the, 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 full sophisticated outcome of the industrial revolution for textiles uh, because it can make very complicated uh, fabric patterns in a, in a fully automated fashion. And it's called a Dobby loom because Dobby is a, is a corruption of the draw boy. The draw boy was the one that would, on, on the back of the machine, would pull the, the warp in particular patterns in order to get the fabric to have a particular pattern. That's all automated for a, through a jacquard device. Pretty interesting. Uh, okay, so I think uh, what I'll do is I'm gonna split this up right here, um, but this is, you know, we're kind of reaching the end. Again, this is like a denouement. You see that the story is kind of just slowing down it seems like everything is pretty stable. There's still some political unrest, but the working class, although they're still protesting, uh, they're given more rights and the protests are being heard to some extent. It's like we're moving into a kind of liberal bourgeois stability. And, and then that liberal bourgeois stability you know, always being fought by the conservatives, but really tending towards a liberal bourgeois stability is something that's gonna continue right, right through the 20th century. Um, you know, with some major upsets, but, but something that is, we're reaching a stability and, and the revolution is slowing down and, and maybe even starting to go backwards in some ways uh, at some points. Okay. Uh, 